Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, a most sincere welcome to those of you who joined us here in person at 8 Norker Georgia Street in Central Dublin and those joining online. My name is Barry Colfer, and it's my most sincere honor to welcome you to this event, Skills in the Digital Age, Equipping Citizens and Workers for the Future. I'm going to hand over to our chair for today, Joyce O'Connor. Thanks as ever for chairing for us, and you may introduce the panel and kick off the event. Thanks very much, Barry, and a very warm welcome to all of you to this event on uh, a really timely topic on skills in the digital age, equipping citizens and workers. Um, today's event, as you know, is hybrid here in uh, North Great Georgia Street. It's great to see all of you and those. I welcome those who are online. And as uh, Barry said, my name is Joyce O'Connor and I chair the digital group and the G digital policy group here at the IIEA. This event is co-organized with the Department of Further and Higher Education, Research, Innovation and Science. And thanks to William Bosong, Assistant Secretary at the department and his team uh, there for their support for this event. We very much appreciate it. Uh, we've got a really interesting panel. Um, we've a, a video first from the Minister Patrick O'Donovan, who is the Minister, as you know, of uh, Further and Higher Education, Research, Innovation and Science. We've got Anna Thomas, who's in London, who's the co-founder and co-director of the Institute of the Future of Work. We've got Francesca Borgononi, who's in Paris, head of the skills analysis team in the OECD Center for Skills. Beside me here is Barry Larry, who's the chief information officer for the government of Ireland, and Gráinne Blake, who is a associate director at KPMG. You're all very welcome. And as you can see, Anna and Francesca will join us online. Um, I, before I start, I would delight it to say that we have for you a paper um, called Skills in the Digital Age, Adapting Ireland's Workforce for the Digital Transition. And this is, I think, a very interesting paper. It's been brought together um, over the last year by work, by work of the Digital Policy Group here at the IIEA, uh, who we had a, a meeting on digital skills. Our key presenter was William Bosong, but we've had discussions over the years on this topic and collaboration between the IIEA and officials at the Department of Further and Higher Education Research and Innovation. So a special thanks to our, the members of our digital policy group and also to the DFRIS team who I see here in the audience. Thanks very much. We very much appreciate working with you and enjoyed it very much. So this paper, I think you may have seen it, but those who are online won't have. Uh, it's published on the IE website, but I've good news for everybody here in the audience. You're going to get a copy that will be sent to you after today's event. So I, I look forward to hearing from you on, you know, on what you think of it and the, the key issues that are have been raised. Now, our event today starts, as I've said, with the keynote address from the Minister. Um, and then I will go to the panellists for opening remarks. And each panellist will speak for seven minutes uh, to the dot. Of seven. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll go to discussion and Q&A with you, the audience. Um, those of you who are online know you can send in questions through the Q&A function at the bottom you know, of, of your screen. And obviously those of you here in uh, North Great George Street we can raise your hand in the usual way. And it would be great if you could give your name and designation you know, when asking the questions. Please feel free to join us on uh, X using the handle at IIEA. And reminder that today's presentation and Q&A is uh, on the record. So with no ado, I'll start with the um, minister's uh, presentation. It's a recorded, a pre-recorded uh, video by the minister. And I think he will set the context for our panelists and their contribution over the next hour or so. I want to add my welcome to today's discussion on a really pivotal topic for Ireland's future. I would like to say thank you to the Institute for hosting the event and to particularly to Professor O'Connor for moderating. Every day we observe how digital technology is changing everything from the way we work to the way we shop to the way we learn. 
by European standards, Ireland fares well in terms of our digital skills of our people, but we can't be complacent. All our citizens need a basic level of digital skills, those in employment, those entering employment, and those who are changing employment. They all need job-ready digital skills, and we need to do more to support them. Our enterprises also need to access uh, specialist digital skills. They also need to make sure that all employees have the right digital skills to adapt to the ever-changing world of work. Our success in skilling, upskilling and reskilling will determine the ability of our enterprises to adapt to new technologies and to become more productive. Our success in skilling uh, will determine how we adapt to AI. There is growing consensus that it will influence almost everybody's work in one form or another. And I would like to think that early adoption uh, could protect us from potential negative impacts and help us embrace the positive and consider where AI can complement people's work. This will determine Ireland's ability to remain a location of choice for mobile investment by firms at the frontier of technological change. My message is, rather than react to technological change, we must, as a country, anticipate it and shape it. So we must make sure that no company, no place of learning, no individual is left behind. Our engagement with this challenge will impact on our economic prosperity and our social cohesion and well-being, and I am committed to driving this agenda. Unfortunately, I can't be with you to listen to the discussion today. I'm particularly interested in hearing how we can mobilise enterprise their employees, researchers, academics, teachers, and our citizens to shape the future through education, upskilling and reskilling, and through research, innovation and science. And I hope you enjoyed the discussions and I look forward to hearing the outcomes. Thank you very much to the Minister for that pre-recording. And I think he's highlighted the issues very well, set the context. And I suppose the message from his is there should be no complacency. So we're going to move on now to our first panelist, Anna Thomas, who's the co-founder and co-director of the Institute of the Future of Work. And Anna's going to speak on the topic of framing skills for the future. But Anna, just before you begin, I just heard this morning that you've been awarded an MBE for your work. So congratulations. That's a great tribute to the work that you and your colleagues are doing in the Institute. So congratulations and well done. Thanks very much. It's been it's been very much a team effort um, and, a, and a joint application of, of, of multidisciplinary skills. Um, yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and thank you so much, um, uh, uh, Joyce um, and everyone for having me and not being put off by the um, election um, in the UK, among other things. It's, it's a real delight um, to be part of the panel. And I'm just very sorry to not be there in person. Um, just a little bit about the Institute for the Future of Work. Um, it's a research and development uh, institute, um, a charitable organisation um, set up initially following the Parliamentary Future of Work Commission, but with Naomi Clymer, who used to run, was the only the, the, the first female president of the Institution of Engineering Technology, and Chris uh, Pissarides, um, who's the Regis Professor of um, uh, of economics at the LSC, but um, his heart really uh, is in is is in Europe, and he's a he's a Cypriot. Um, so that's uh, by way of background. Um, we focus on the on looking at the impacts of new technologies, in particular, on work working lives uh, and and society. And we're also at the moment uh, running. We've pulled together the Pissarides Review on Work and Wellbeing. Um, which is a, a sort of a collaboration between universities um, and others, and has work streams at a, a at a at a at an economic, a macro level, a firm level, and an individual level, which we're pulling together to try and get a more holistic understanding um, of uh, how uh, changes to uh, changes are happening uh, in terms of labor market, rewiring the, the, the labor market to business models at a firm level um, and the skills needed and their demand too. Um, and that ranges, we think, from AI literacy, from digital skills and literacy, um, but also to the core skills that everyone will need um, in their jobs now and in the future. Um, and we're also putting that together with uh, individual level surveys, so firm level surveys and individual level surveys, um, to really dig down into what, what the impacts are on quality, job quality and conditions, and how that in turn uh, may impact skills. So all of those things we think are relevant to really thinking about skills not just now but in the future and allows us to begin to think about uh, trajectories and choices um, as well as demands that are identified now uh, by firms. I should say that this is our organisation, it's not part um, 
of the it's not it's not it's not a part of a government plan we're hoping very much to apply it and turn it into pilot soon um and, and we would be delighted if there was interest um in 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 ireland um uh, but but it's it, it's at the moment it's a, it's a research development and policy stage so i was going to having given you that overview um uh, um, uh, or shared that overview, have a couple of deep dives, look at a couple of deep dives that we've done recently that may be interesting, um, and then pull out some policy implications um, for us, hopefully, to discuss uh, as, as a panel and with, uh, with, the, with the audience. Um, the other thing, actually, that I intended to say was that um, we are finding in all our work streams that there is a real need to look at these different levels, you know, economic or macro, firm and uh, individual level, and also to look right across the entire innovation ecosystem. Um, um, in order to 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 really bottom out how how and why things are changing, um, um, and the particular role that skills and capabilities has in that right across the innovation ecosystem. So from the point that you're that we're doing research and development, that we're applying research and development, that we're disseminating research and development, um, that we are. Uh, you know, initiating startups, that we're accelerating startups and scaling them, uh, supporting them, um, and then, of course, spillovers into communities. So in a sense, uh, this this it may sound a bit uh, a bit sort of high level, but perhaps it has to be um, at the beginning. Um, uh, and it requires, um, we think, the need to sort of pull together and thinking about job cycles, career cycles, and tech life cycles. And now I hope I've got enough time to say a little bit about two uh, particularly important work streams, which are at the moment are um, uh, where the academic analysis is ongoing, but we've got enough uh, to share, both in forms of some published materials, the Disruption Index and a new skills paper that's been out in the last couple of months, but also things that are in the pipeline and about to come out. Um, one thing we've done, um, and I suspect uh, KPMG may be doing, a, uh, may may have done a similar thing, um, uh, but uh, um, we we uh, but we're doing it with, I suppose, this particular sort of multidisciplinary outlook. Um, is is examine uh, skills uh, by looking at Adzuna data, which is a sort of unique skill set that breaks skills down into sort of 4,000 different skills by reference to job descriptions. Um, and on top of that, we validated it and we put it into groups, into, into themes. Um, and we've used that, a combination of our sort of multidisciplinary team, but with admit, but using AI itself, so using applying digital skills um, to 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 put it into clusters so use a clustering methodology to help us look again not just at skills demands now not just this snapshot view but examine uh, how the skills content of jobs is changing which is almost tantamount to to thinking about how jobs are changing and it's perhaps a new and better way of thinking about that than putting a sort of single statistic or a likelihood on something so skills content which skills are emerging and which skills are disappearing um uh, which I suppose occupations are changing the most with regard to their skills content and also the skills turnover. Um, and more recently, we've extended that work to look at which skills are transferring between occupations and between sectors, because we think they're going to be particularly important. Again, not just in terms of immediate digital literacy and readiness, although as the minister says, that's very, very important too, but also um, in terms of of, of, of understanding the implications of that um, for other skills and occupations. So um, in a nutshell, um, there is, uh, you know, we are finding that there are some new skills coming out and we're seeing those feature sort of things like our iCloud and web services, ethics, cybersecurity. Um, so um, IT and sort of analysis skills. But again, um, as you may anticipate, um, and I think it's in the report, um, care, job jobs that, 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 that demonstrate the ongoing importance of that socio-technical outlook and of caring communication um, and other very uh, human uh, 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 skills. Um, uh, and in addition to that, it's demonstrating quite clearly that it varies hugely by region and by industry mix. So we, so we, so the need to go into sort of granular 
um, analysis of industry mix and what's happening in a particular region is, we think, becoming uh, really sharply understood at the moment. Um, and that's been brought out by the DI, but I can see the clock sticking on and I should move very quickly onto the policy implications of that. Um, hope to leap back to some of it, um, but uh, we are um, in a nutshell uh, thinking that th this, this sort of very complex picture is really inviting, fairly urgent and why big scale pilots and the sharing of knowledge in a different way, the reframing of the skills of, uh, debate to broaden it, to think about the whole skills pipeline, demand um, and supply, and the sort of cycles um, within the innovation system as a whole, um, the, the importance of lifelong learning and, and preparing everybody cross sector um, is, 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 is hugely significant. And so is the digital divide. And I'm very sorry, Joyce, for running over. Um, uh, look forward to leaping back to some of that. Thank you very much, Anna. You did very well. I must say you covered a lot and, and I think inspired us by some of your thinking there. And I think the key point, obviously, is the changing nature of skills, that skills and the diversity of skills that are not just technical, but transversal and that life cycle. And I think our other presenters, I think, will uh, also under pin some of the things that you've been saying but I think what you're looking for are new models of learning and teaching way we're looking at work and uh, thank you very much for that contribution um, we move on now to Francesca Francesca as I said is the head of the skills analysis team at the OECD Centre for Skills and Francesca will in a way, develop some of uh, some of the things that Anna has been talking about, but looking at AI, innovation, skills, development and inclusive growth and looking at the research that her, her centre and herself have been working on oh, recently. So thank you very much, uh, Francesca, for being with us and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Joyce and uh, thanks everyone for the invitation and the possibility to present some of our uh, work. Um, I think my presentation, uh, and I will show you some graphs, is very much aligned with what um, Anna said. So in a sense, if you're more a um, uh, words person, then Anna's presentation is great. If you need images, I guess that my presentation will go through some of the same themes, uh, but just with some graphs. So uh, I think it's one of the beautiful things that technology does is actually gives opportunities to people people with diverse preferences in terms of uh, skill set and what they can do. So let me briefly share um, my presentation. The very first slide that I wanted to show you is uh, actually very much aligned with what the minister said uh, in terms of the need to engage individuals and communities uh, in uh, how um, technological developments are adopted and how they shape both the labor market but our societies more, more generally. And here are some results on perceptions of uh, adult populations in OECD countries and whether they feel that uh, AI uh, will mostly help or mostly harm in the next uh, 20 years. Uh, just for disclosure, this data was collected in 2021, so it predates, uh, I would say, uh, the big uh, buzz of, of generative AI, and probably some of the results in terms of people having fairly polarized attitudes uh, have just grown wider over time. And what you see here is that 35% of adults in OECD countries held pessimistic visions of AI, while 42% of adults in OECD countries held an optimistic vision of AI. I just wanted to flag the results for Ireland, where pessimists are 28% and optimists 47%. So in general, in Ireland, attitudes are a little bit more optimistic uh, than, uh, than on average across OECD countries. And one of the things that uh, we have looked in the context of the skills outlook uh, 
uh, which is the big report we launched in 2023, at the very end of 2023, on emerging skill demands as a result of the digital, but also green transition. So one thing that is important to bear in mind is that uh, digital transition is not happening in isolation. It's going hand in hand with many other changes in society, whether that's the green transition or the demographic transition, for example. We actually thought about, okay, uh, technological development needs uh, skills to be developed, okay? So in a sense, what kind of skills do we need uh, to develop? In this case, I will focus on AI so that we have AI professionals that can develop, maintain, and adapt AI systems, but also data technicians uh, that can facilitate uh, the adoption of AI systems through better data infrastructures, for example. But then there's also like what um, developments in technology mean in terms of uh, the set of skills that, that individuals will need on the one hand to work alongside AI, but on the other to live in a world in which AI is used. So it will impact workers more generally, but also the population. And the very first part uh, I will focus on is on the set of skills uh, that are needed to develop, maintain, and adapt AI systems. When we looked at uh, um, online vacancy data, so we took a similar approach to what Anna uh, was uh, was describing, looking at data from Lightcast, uh, a, another company, and looking at um, standardized uh, data for 14 OECD countries and trends between 2019 and 2020. Two, what we saw is that the share of online vacancies that require AI skills has increased over time from 0.30% in 2019 to 0.40% in 2022. And the first thing to notice is that this is very small. It's a very small number. This doesn't mean that it's not significant, but the number of people that are being required to actually develop AI systems, uh, it, it remains small in a population level kind of, uh, of, uh, um, of, of analysis. Now, of course, with generative AI, things have changed a little bit, but in fact, we haven't seen a huge spike in terms of uh, uh, trend uh, in 2023 and 2024. And there has been a little bit of variation across countries, average increase of 33%, but in some countries, this is uh, much, much bigger. Now, in terms of uh, where are uh, AI developers uh, being sought, an important uh, thing to uh, consider is that uh, the data I'm, I'm showing are data not in terms of stock of workers, but rather in terms of flows. So what are companies demanding uh, uh, and how is this changing over time? Well, in which sectors are AI professionals being sought? Uh, one quarter in professional activities, another quarter in ICT, and 13% uh, uh, in manufacturing. But I would like to point out that in the United States, uh, things look quite different in terms of uh, where is the profile being sought after than in other countries. And I think this is relevant also for how we interpret a lot of the evidence on AI uh, deployment that comes from the US in other contexts that, uh, uh, that may be in fact quite different. Now, in terms of uh, thinking about the set of skills that are required or are demanded out of AI professionals, what we do see is that, of course, technical skills are very, very important. But in fact, there's an entire set of skills such as communication skills, leadership skills, management skills that are highly demanded out of AI professionals, in particular by companies that hire a lot of AI talent. So non, uh, I would say transferable skills um, are, and people skills are extremely important also for, uh, for uh, um, uh, very technical profile. Now, in terms of uh, uh, what kind of skills will workers and the general population need, what we looked at was as a result of uh, uh, general technical adoption and green growth policies, uh, how will the skill profile of workers change of 
well, of occupations that will change in demand between now and 2030 evolve. And we identify three sets of skills as growing in importance. One is skills to work alongside people. One set of skills is skills to work alongside technology. And finally, skills to work across occupations and industries, so transferable skills. And uh, in terms of uh, what happens at the population, um, skills to live in a world in which AI is used. Uh, two things uh, in terms of work that we have done. We looked at the evolving capabilities of AI systems uh, and what has happened uh, since to November 2022. The OECD is responsible for the Program for International Student Assessment, uh, testing 15-year-olds uh, uh, in literacy, numeracy, science, as well as results as of uh, this week uh, on creativity. And what you can see is that uh, um, um, uh, generative AI actually performs uh, at par or much better than 15-year-olds in some foundation skills. Now, what will this mean in the future in terms of uh, how our education systems should uh, should evolve uh, remains to be seen. But what we do know is that foundation skills such as literacy and numeracy are fundamental to be able to use the output and evaluate uh, how well the output of AI systems uh, are fit for purpose. And unfortunately, what, uh, what we do see is that in information-rich societies, uh, uh, in fact, there is a sizable number of individuals, of adults, uh, who has very low levels of proficiency in both literacy and numeracy. Across OECD countries, this is 16%. In Ireland, is is very similar. And with this, I will close. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. I think you clearly highlighted again these core issues. And I think it's very interesting that we your diagram where you show AI skills uh, and policies, that there's different levels of support required. It's not one glove fits all. And again, your emphasis on core skills, transferable skills, transversal skills, but also that importance about processing that data. And I think we all realize that data is, is the new gold. Mm -hmm. And so digital literacy and numeracy are also critical. So thank you very much for highlighting those factors for us from your study. We move on now to our next speaker is Barry Larry, and Barry is the Chief Information Officer of the Government of Ireland. And Barry's presentation will look at Ireland's skills challenge in the digital age. Barry, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Joyce, and thank you for asking me. Uh, I think this is a, a fascinating subject. I think it's a really important subject, actually. So we just move on, Lorgan. I'll get into the presentation. What I want to do over seven minutes is really try and show you some stats to show you the scale of the skills challenge in Ireland um, and the context of it. And then I want to talk about some of the things that I've seen that actually excite me. And I think we should really be actively having conversations about how to scale those up at national level. So if we just go to the next slide and on again. So um, I, I start a lot of talks with this because... One of the things that really impressed and amazed me about President von der Leyen's State of the Union speech in September 2021. So this was as we were starting to ease our way out of Europe or out of, uh, <laughs> out of COVID. <laughs> that, was, that was our colleagues across the water were doing that. Um, as we were trying to ease our way out of COVID, uh, she gave her State of the uh, Union speech and she actually put digital up front and centre. It's the first time I've ever heard a politician lead with digital as being a societal game changer in a, in a speech. And so what came out of that speech was basically three uh, main European initiatives. The first one was the Recovery and Resilience Fund. Uh, which was basically where Europe were putting funding into worthy projects. And Ireland benefited quite a bit from that. Uh, the second one was a host of, le of legislation and regulation, which I'm sure you've heard, Digital Services Act, Data Governance Act, Data Act, now the AI Act, and so on. And the third one was a set of targets for member states. And this was called the Digital Compass. And this is quite fascinating, actually. And I think the EU got it pretty right with this. So what they said was, you can break these challenges into four areas. 
And they're all very important, but they're all hugely interdependent. So it's generally accepted now that countries that have a really strong digital government offering have really strong digital economies. You know, Denmark, Estonia, uh, Singapore, great examples of that. If we're going to build great digital government services, we need skills. If you look at the bottom uh, in Ireland, uh, we have businesses which are either exemplary in their use of digital or way behind their curve in their use of digital. And, and that would be similar across Europe. So this idea that if we could grow the digital in the business, then the economy will naturally grow is, is effectively true. But to do that and to do it at scale in all parts of our island or in Europe, you need infrastructure. So the interdependence then of business and infrastructure and business and skills speaks for itself. And of course, when businesses flourish, we make more money and we reinvest those into skills and into infrastructure and so on. So that's why this is really important. Uh, I'll not go through all the targets, but uh, if you just look at the skills ones, uh, we'll come back to those 20 million ICT specialists and gender uh, convergence, and then a target against basic digital skills, which we're not really talking about today, but Ireland's doing very well, and that's 70% against 80%. So if you just move to the next slide and on again. So I want to remind everyone that uh, when the Tonishta launched the white paper for enterprise, he didn't talk about Ireland meeting EU targets. He talked about Ireland way exceeding them. Because when you say you're going to be amongst the best, that's effectively what you're saying. Um, and he talked about Ireland being more or less of the best. You know, And whether you follow football or rugby or whatever, I'm a huge soccer fan, unfortunately a Tottenham Hotspur fan. But um, you know what you see is if you say you're going to win the Champions League, you have a plan. You know, and that plan includes buying the best players, getting the best coaches, bringing diet in, growing a football academy, all of those things. So it's a purposeful series of interventions to achieve an endpoint, which you've stated. So if we if we see that as the endpoint that we're heading towards, if we go to the next slide, let's see how we're getting on. So 200 million is about uh, 20 million. Sorry, is about 10 percent of the EU skills workforce. So in Ireland, if we're talking about exceeding 10%, how are we doing? Well, just looking at the stats that we have, uh, we've about 2.7 million people in our workforce, and we've about 106,000 working in the IT sector. Now that's very specifically those organizations that are generating, generating IPR and income for the country, the Microsofts of this world, you know, or, or the near forms, if we look at an indigenous example. Um, so at this moment in time, less than 4% are actually employed in, in ICT uh, companies against a 10% minimum target. So if we jump again, Lorgan, uh, this is uh, a CSO slide, um, but you can see on the right hand side, it was less than 100,000 in 2019. What that tells us is two things. One is the, the figures are broadly consistent, but secondly, we haven't really moved on that much in the post-COVID uh, world. And I know there was a downturn in the economy and we're seeing an up and so on, but net, we haven't changed that much. If we go to the next slide. So um, we'll just look then briefly at, at skills because obviously one of our great inputs to trying to develop talent is our graduates. Uh, and in the, in the class of 22, there were uh, 85,645 graduates, which was actually down from 2021. And uh, the number of graduates in ICT was 6.5%. So again, uh, when we're growing talent, we're not just growing them for our digital sector or companies, but companies like Citibank, JP Morgan, Aer Lingus, government itself, all the companies, organizations that are trying to create a better society, a more economically just society, all of those things all need are fighting for this talent. And that's a problem that we've got. 
And as you can see, the female uh, proportion of that is, is very low, um, sadly low. Um, we just go to the next slide again. Here, a major issue is, uh, and this is just something the Irish Times covered earlier this year, that uh, we're not seeing people take up uh, technical degrees and finishing them. We've got a very high dropout level, 18% as it says there. What does that tell us? Does it tell us we're not attracting the right people into doing tertiary level degrees? Does it tell us that we're not actually creating degrees that meet the needs of the people who are coming into third level education? All I can do is, is, is put up the stats, but we'll maybe have a conversation about that afterwards. So if we can jump just to the next slide and the next one again. So potential remedies um, in government, we're obviously well down the food chain when it comes to attracting talent. So we've got to be uh, innovative. And so one of the things that we decided we would do was an ICT apprenticeship. This is something I'm personally passionate about. Uh, when, I, when I was in my previous role up north, we set up one there as well, because I believe that uh, IT digital careers are an absolute privilege to be part of. And why are we letting an education system and someone being lucky or unlucky with their careers advice and so on to decide their future and miss out on something which I think is one of the most motivating and worthwhile careers that you can work in. So the tech apprenticeship was very much, if you like, a second opportunity for a career uh, in, in digital ICT. Um, we set it up with uh, our colleagues in FIT and... Uh, the second government, the first government intake was a proof of concept. The second one's underway with over 100 ICT apprenticeships. So you can see how we've got the basics of something that we could scale up way beyond what we've got at the moment. And that excites me. Um, the other one actually was how we learned from the apprenticeship scheme. And like any organizations, you're looking at how... AI and technology is going to change your own requirement to pivot your skills away from what are the things we're not going to do and what are the things we're going to need to do more of. And this is a way of trying to take people out of areas where maybe they're very highly clerically based. We don't need to do so much of those. And, and where they've got the aptitude, retrain them to be on the other side of the fence and using uh, digital skills and We'll get on to the transversal skills because I think that's key to have better quality jobs that are more impactful. So if you just jump to the next slide. This is something which we've just uh, announced in our department. This is actually taking people who are um, have left the career ladder for a period of time, possibly to bring up a family, possibly to care for a relative, whatever it happens to be. And can we create an environment which in which they can come back. And of course, part of that can be planned or flexible learning, but uh, working, sorry, and other parts of it can be retraining. So that's an exciting scheme. And if we jump again, this is something actually that, that I developed uh, with, with my team during COVID because we were very interested in how transversal skills were such a key part of IT jobs. So very much aligned with what the OECD said earlier, but a vast, number of the jobs that are essential to ICT enable transformation need transversal skills. And if you think of the sort of skill sets you need to run a restaurant, for example, how many of those could lead you into leading an IT transformation project? And it is huge. And all you're really saying, instead of a technical skill set around food, you have a technical skill set around digital technologies. So uh, if we just jump to the next slide, this is something uh, because we need to, it's not just about secondary and third level. We've got to start with children. And I didn't know Karen was coming in this. Uh, otherwise, I might not use this slide, but no. And this is something that inspires me. So this is a Microsoft initiative uh, called Dream Space. And it's about inspiring children that technology and digital is about problem solving and it's exciting, and, and it's a great career. And I don't know, Karen. maybe you'll say in the conversation if you've done any longitudinal studies about how many of these kids actually end up taking degrees and becoming the graduates of tomorrow. We'll maybe get into that in the conversation. 
The other one on the right is really small scale, but this is an initiative that uh, Dublin have done uh, with um, a couple of the schools in the area, and it's teaching children through Lego to develop their creative thinking and getting them really inspired by problem solving and starting to see there's actually a whole host of careers that pass naturally through from that area of working. So it's really fascinating. And that's the sort of small idea that I think government really needs to get into looking at seriously and starting to see can we scale it up. So I think that's it. We just move to the next, yeah. Thanks very much, Barry. I think you set out very clearly this the scale of the problem, um, but also emphasise the points that are that Anna and Francesca have said about the importance of you know these core skills and a new way of looking at technology. I've always felt the reason for women not taking up technology is they saw it as a cold, impersonal way uh, and no relationship with people. But in fact, technology is about empowering people, giving them a way to grow and develop and has amazing impact in so many areas. And that's that inspiration I think women need, yeah. you know, to as others do. And I think typically you've given examples of what could be done, whether it's dream space, the work with Lego, ARC, or the technical ICT apprenticeships. Uh, but I think this is maybe we'd have this discussion, uh, you know, and I, I know Karen um, or Gronya's uh, presentation will perhaps deal with some of this, just new ways innovative ways of learning and teaching different models and scaling it up that not one size fits all. We have a very traditional set of delivery of courses, skills, of training, and this variation and flexibility could be embraced, I think. So thank you very much for that, for showing that it can be done. So we now move on to Gronia. Gronia Blake, Associate Director of KPMG. And I think Gronia's presentation will be very interesting because she's going to look at digital skills from a practitioner's perspective. Thank you, Gronia. So hi everyone, I'm Gronia and uh, I'm a musician. Yeah, don't really know why I'm here today. And um, well, at least at the ripe age of 18, I thought I would stand by that for the rest of my life. Genuinely, I was going to be a career musician. That's what I wanted to be. I did an undergrad in music and I got a scholarship to go over to the UK uh, to study musicology. So um, I had really good lecturers there who taught me about critical thinking and how to have really good, robust debates. I loved it. Really, really enjoyed it. Um, I, I turned, I think I was 21 then after that, and I, I moved to London, uh, followed some friends, made some rash decisions. And um, I needed to get a, a job with a paid salary, right? And I, I landed into a, a sales career. And um, I worked there for two years and I had an existential crisis. It's like, <laughs> what am I doing? I studied music. I'm so far removed from what I wanted to do. Um, I handed in my notice on a whim and came in the next day and the CEO tapped on my shoulder and said, Grania, will you come and have a conversation with me? I was like, absolutely. It's in fear. And um, he said, I want you to lead a change initiative for me. And I was like, okay, like, I want this to be a technology company, not a company that leverages tech. And I want you to lead that for me. And I was like, surely you could find someone better, anyone else. And he gave me, I suppose, a leave of confidence when he said, you know the domain of this company, you've worked for me for four years now, and you know all the people, you get on really well with all the people, and we're gonna be on a big change journey here. It's not just about the tech that sits behind that. And in the meantime, I will help you upskill. I will put you on accreditation A, accreditation B, whatever it might be to get you to that point in time where you can confidently lead those teams. So I ended up staying, surprise, surprise. And I stayed there for another two years. And I really saw that shift from the company being a company that leveraged legacy technology to being at the foreground. And it still is today leading in terms of like security services and um, and being that tech company that does so. So after that, I moved on. I, I joined a, a startup um, and I went into some innovation labs and we I got really into design thinking. And I basically just had really great colleagues around me who held my hand through a lot of different ex experimentation phases and had great fun. 
And I met some really, really good people along the way. And part of that, I met someone who was involved in a consultancy, uh, but only working in the public sector in the UK. And uh, he asked me, will you come and join my team? So I made that shift from startups, scale-ups, rapid innovation, and moved across to consultancy for, for government. And I worked with HMRC, Maritime and Coast Guard Agency, and we're building out services for citizens. And I had that kind of gotcha moment where I was like, this is what I want to do with my career. I want to be helping to improve citizens' lives via tech. Uh, how cool. How great. And then... Um, I suppose on, on the back of that, I should reintroduce myself and say, hi, I'm Gráinne. I'm not a musician. Um, I'm an associate director at KPMG and I lead our like, product and digital strategy team. So that's one little story about me. Um, but I mentioned that I've been working in a consultancy and we were scaling quickly and um, not able to source candidates. And we got in a team in, in room as a, as a leadership team. We said, this isn't a short-term problem. Like we need a way to tactically solve this problem for ourselves. And one of my colleagues had an idea about setting up a, an academy, what we call the boot camp, right? And we said, right, we'll take people from the market, which really aligns with some of the themes today, right? Non-technical people, non-technical. Everyone's technical to an extent these days, right? As a theme. We'll take them from the job market and we'll run them through through that three month boot camp, and um, you know, looking at things like infrastructure as code, running cloud services, front end, back end technology. So they come out at the end of that as a software engineer, three months. So we did it, and we we're all a bit dubious. We're saying let's give it a go and see how it turns out. Enter Zach. Um, Zach was fresh out of boot camp and he joined one of my teams and uh, he joined as the most junior software engineer with um, a big scraggly beard and, and lots of experience in, in other means. So Zach was actually in the Navy for 14 years and decided he wanted to get more technical, joined the boot camp and came through. So he's working with people who are younger than him, but more senior than him. But it was super interesting to see the, the dynamic in the room in terms of working in that cross-discipline team. So although Zach was technically the most junior, he had really good critical thinking skills. He was a problem solver. He asked great questions. And like the whole team was captivated by him to the point where the, the client was like, that's Zach that guy, don't let him go. Keep him, he's a keeper. Um, so I suppose the point I'm trying to tell there is that Zach had lots of transversal skills, um, just like I did to move across into um, tech and ICT. And we targeted him to join our company and brought on lots of more people that were like Zach. And then finally, I just wanted to talk about another, another person who's entered my life recently. Um, so at KPMG, we do a, an apprenticeship scheme. Um, sorry, not apprenticeship scheme. That's not, not correct. We do a graduate scheme. So people who come out of, of uh, university, we bring them on that journey. But we also do placements when people are in college, right? Um, and there's a chap called Ryan who's joined my team recently and we're doing a digital strategy for a key client. And uh, he's in a second year in his degree. And he said to me the other day, whoa, I am learning so much on the job. He said the ways of working, how you are all like outcome focused, the way you're all hive mind around a problem, the way you like question and query like each other's thinking and you all ultimately just want to get to shift the needle on some kind of outcome or problem and you're happening to use like technology to do so yeah. um so they are i suppose in a nutshell um zach ryan and myself are what i think should be personas for our future workforce you know trying to just bring bring it alive in terms of what that looks like we need to be like the the rule and not the exception i think Ryan's journey is maybe a bit more traditional coming through the Comsky degree up through the workforce, but we need to find targeted ways to find more archetypes and design pathways forward for them. So it's great to hear some of the stuff that Barry is mentioning there. But I suppose I'm at a point in my career now where I need to find the space to like find more talent whilst constantly keeping my skill set up to date as well. You know, it's keeping myself relevant for that market that's ultimately always changing. And something we talk about quite a bit is the 70-20-10 model. So 70% of your, your, your learning is done like by doing, right? By experiencing it. 20% um, learned by interactions with others. So colleagues that might have done it before or 
people who might have done things in a different domain. And then 10% coming from that formal educational experience. So I've had that as a thread throughout my career um, thus far. But I need to have that 70, 20, 10% approach. So I think the key thing is, for me anyway, as a practitioner, is like, how do we get people into the mix more to do more of the doing? And how do we get more archetypes that are more diverse? Like as Barry was saying, 27% females is in ICT still. Yeah, like I am quite often still the only woman in a room um, when it comes to like tech and digital. Um, and that's just one element, right? There's lots of other ways you can think of diversity. Um, so yeah, in a nutshell, as I said, I think it'd be great if we can think of archetypes, personas of the future, and how we use design thinking to think of that workforce management and how we get people into more digital roles. Thank you very much, Gráinne, for that. I think, you know, that existential crisis really paid yeah. off. <laughs> and indeed, your protocol or protocol for the future may be an avatar because it's the thinking, it's the mindset, it's the culture. And in a way, you're talking about delivery of skills at a time, place and pace that suits the learner. It's about action yeah. learning that we're constantly learning. And you know what? We've been talking about lifelong learning, action learning, work learning, workplace learning for a long time. But examples like yourself and indeed what Barry has examples he's given, that's what makes the difference. And it's to capture that. So thank you very much for that. That's really interesting. And now I'm going over for questions. Um, I think, unfortunately, Anna had to go. So are there any questions here that we might like to, to start with? Seamus, you would like to ask a question? Hi, I'm Seamus Allen, a digital policy researcher here at the IAA. Uh, so my first question, I think this is a thing you've already mentioned. But I'm just wondering, you know, we have such rapid technological change, so much change in the workforce and in the skills that workers need. And how can we have an education system or a system that promotes skills that can actually keep up with that technological change? You know, what are the risks that people who specialize for four years in something and then suddenly a few years later their skills are out of date? How, how do we build an education or skill system that is resilient to kind of adapt to that? Resilient and I suppose creating that context of lifelong learning. Francesca, we might go over to you first. Did you hear that question? Yes, I mean. Thank yeah, you. yeah, I think I, I got that correctly, although the, the sound was not perfect. Uh, but I, I, I would actually refer back to another report we did in 2021 on lifelong learning. And we often think, think about skills without talking about attitudes um, and mindsets. And I do think that working on attitudes and mindsets in particular, why should education all be at the very beginning and then nothing happens? Or as policymakers, we do not know how to make that 70% and 20% actually more efficacious. At the moment, what informal learning and non-formal learning we do actually happens. Sometimes it's really successful, but sometimes it's not. And in terms of quality assurance, we have very little in terms of understanding how well different systems work, learning from what happens in different companies, in different countries, and et cetera. So in terms of knowledge management, I think we could do much better in that front, but also investing in the initial education system to build the attitude of learning for life. So it's not that once you get your degree, your piece of paper, that's the ceiling of your learning. Act, uh, well, act, uh, the how much you can get. You can get so much more, and in fact, you need to build on what you have. So the function of education system needs to change to build the foundation upon which individuals will be able to learn throughout their lives. And fundamental to this is an attitudinal shift in mm -hmm. how individuals approach learning, finding it extremely fun and valuable to change domain uh, like we just heard but also finding what commonalities and synergies and how to actually be able to build upon that thank you francesca Cron, would you like yeah. to for me it's about honing on honing in on those like fundamental foundational skills and what they are and always learning 
always knowing that we can build upon those. So if we take uh, AI, we're in the hype here, right, for, for AI. Um, but what do we think sits behind that in the future? It's like prompt engineering. Someone who can ask a really good question to a machine is going to be really strong at leveraging AI. What does that link to? Critical thinking, problem solving. So for me, it's about finding those foundational skills first and foremost that will always link to you know, the next technology going forward. And those people can upskill on those technologies to Francesca's point there as part of their lifelong career. Like I have to do that. I will be yeah. left behind if I don't do that. Yeah. Um, but I have the foundations, I hope, um, that will enable me to, to keep learning as I as the, the levers change and the, the dynamic and the context changes as well. Barry, how, how do we build that into the system yeah, it's, in a meaningful way? It's really interesting because two observations, you know, one, when Francesca put up her slide on the technical skills versus the transversal skills, there was so much on the left-hand side. Yes. No one's going to yeah. learn all of that. No. So in some respects, we've got to say, when we give someone third-level education, what you're really trying to give them is understanding of the principles of delivering yeah. great yeah. IT systems, whichever part of that yeah. that they're that they're they're on, and then depending on who they join, they can they can do fairly intense training on the actual yeah. technology. The other thing is that when you look, even even if you looked at a company like Microsoft, you know, um, and actually looked at the skills of people there, there's actually quite a small proportion of people who are working at the high end of technical mm -hmm. all the time. And, and in organizations like ours and government, it's more about the softer skills of enacting change through digital than the digital skills themselves. Mm -hmm. And even then, you know, they're fleeting because you need to build a certain piece of technology. And we work with the experts in the industry and we build that. But after that, you don't need another one for a mm. while, mm. you know. So mm. I think we need to think differently about equipping people with the ability to use digital and help us drive our company, organizational or national objectives forward. Thanks, Barry. This gentleman here. Thank you. And then I've got Kevin, Shane, I think. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Atikule Gomez from the Africa Institute, a follower of the other North London uh, Club, as now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I just have to we wish you. That problem. I just have to wish you good luck for the coming season. That's <laughs> you, so. um, well, those of us who are familiar with the work of uh, E.F. Schumacher in the uh, or read his books would uh, um, uh, know how passionate he is about the future technology in society. And in one of his books, this is what he said. When our machines are bigger and smarter than we are, they cease to be our servants and become our masters. I was uh, coming from a social science background. I was very interested in, like, I mean, a lot of stuff was said, but what jumped uh, at me was your uh, reference to human-centered. I like that a lot. So my question is, uh, how do we ensure that uh, in this uh, uh, new environment, we maintain that human uh, humanness of um, uh, the new technology? Thank you. So in government, um, what, what we're specifically doing is uh, we've launched the design principles for government. And we have a government decision that they will be used now for all new initiatives come yeah. forward. And the very first of the design principles is user-centered. And actually the second one relates to user-driven. In other words, uh, you cannot have people designing systems for government that don't reflect the diversity of the people who need those systems. And so what we're increasingly doing is bringing in the people who are affected by the policies learning their life journeys, learning their problems and trying to work out how to pivot technology as part of an overall change system, which meets their requirements going forward. So user at the center of everything. And actually that's one of the amazing things about the technical world, because we're now starting to see disruptive technologies, which open up the door 
to make lives easier for users, whether we're talking about IoT or AI itself. So you're starting to say now there's technical opportunities to do things better for people, look after the elderly better in their homes because IoT can help us see that they're moving around, you know, they're boiling the kettle, they're okay. You know, all of those things. So it, it's about trying to understand the user journey and then how technology can help change that. And that's very much at the center of all government do. But you're increasingly seeing it with organizations, the big organizations of the world that they've realized. I mean, I, I often use the quote from Steve Jobs where he says, believe it or not, even in Apple, everything starts with the user experience. Yeah. So, you know, that was at the core of their belief system. Uh, and it's certainly at the core of government. Right. And that's the way it should be going forward. Thanks, Barry. I'm going to, there's three questions. I'm going to get them together. Kevin, Shane, is it? Sh Mark, sorry, it was new Mark and Ted, yes. Kevin, yeah. Um, Kieran, actually, Kieran oh, McCurry, I know you're fine. Yeah. Kieran McCurry, um, I'm the National Technology Officer for Microsoft, and um, it's actually not a question, it's an answer to Barry's oh, question. Gosh, yeah. Barry, I'll be very brief because yeah. I know that time is tight. Um, thanks for mentioning the, the uh, Dream Space um, program, Barry. We started that in 2018 with an ambition to reach 100,000 school kids on the island of Ireland, and we've revised it now to reach yeah, a million fantastic. because it's been yeah. so successful. Um, just in terms of longitudinal success, we did engage with Maynooth University a while back to look at the success of the programme. Um, and there were at least two fascinating outcomes, um, a 90% increase in um, engagement uh, around STEM and, and interest in STEM careers for students um, and, and the views from teachers. But just to pick up on the point about um, gender diversity, yeah. um, there was a 42% increase in females more likely to go on to a career okay. in STEM yeah. Um, than prior to the programme. Mm. Thanks, That's Kieran. It. That's Thanks. very good. Mark and then Ted. So I suppose the starting point for the question is threefold. We, You noted Apple, uh, the Apple boss's comments that we start with the user in everything we do. And I noted earlier um, the reference by Anna and then I think Francesca to sharing knowledge yeah, and Francesca to the bottom of the pyramid, making sure that citizens can live in an AI world. So I'm all, I'm, I'm trying to connect this conversation with the voter who is both the tax funder and the user of, of, of government services. And uh, I congratulate you for the apprenticeship, by the way, because I think the key issue is the difficulties the public sector have incentivizing skills and digital skills. And I get that. I've worked in the public sector. I started a, an, in, a, an apprenticeship in 2015. I was quite alone. It's good to see that happening. But my question is, realistically, to satisfy the end user citizen need uh, that the general election is going to underscore in terms of concerns about patients on trolleys, how the health service is op operating, we would like to wait for that apprenticeship and that learning to, you know, filter through. But noting the commission and what it said about the National Recovery and Resilience Plan, significant delays need to accelerate. Uh, is it maybe time to adopt the sharing knowledge principle that Anna was talking about and see if we can learn from best practice in other EU countries in terms of how we can implement the e-government agenda? Because I, I know for my own sake, what I see coming around the corner is that the pressure uh, to roll out everything from, you know, integrated care development, e-prescriptions, all of that stuff is going to intensify after the next election. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. And then, Ted, I'll just take those two questions together. Thank you. Maybe different. This is, this is in a European context. Uh, the minister mentioned earlier on uh, sort of the risk of complacency. Uh, earlier this year, Digital Europe ran a Masters of Digital conference, very well attended, excellent conference, very good attendance, more than 2,000 online and live participants. Oh. Now, one disappointment at this conference was that although there were more than 27 uh, speakers uh, and panellists, there was no Irish representative on the platform. And I sort of feel that this is maybe a little bit of a challenge to, to up our digital profile. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to resist going to you immediately. I go to go to Grania and then Francesco and let you summarise if if that's okay, Barry. 
Fran Francesca first. Francesca. Oh. Would you want to go you to me? You're on, yes, sorry. Okay. okay. Um, because you might might not think that I'd have strong opinions based on my background and what you just talked talked about there, but um, I've I've actually worked in the UK for for twelve years there, mainly in the the public sector, and um, I worked with the NHS team, I worked in HMRC, I worked at the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency, um, my opinion as a practitioner landing back into Ireland is there's a lot we can even learn from our UK counterparts. Um, I know we're doing great stuff in Ireland. I'm a citizen here. There's a reason why I wanted to move back home, having been in the UK for such a long time. But I would just completely agree with you from a practitioner's perspective that there's more we can do, there's more we can learn, and knowledge sharing is integral. Like, if you even link knowledge sharing back down to the first principles of upskilling, as you were saying in Francesca's presentation, um, Communities of practice are one of the main ways in which I have learned my discipline and my skill set as a practitioner. And that's been by doing outreach to different organizations, different meetups, different agendas, and having that cross-discipline approach. Um, so I suppose in a nutshell, what I'm saying is completely agree. Um, but I suppose I'm not in a, a position to, to drive that forward. But I'd love to be in a means and position to help drive that agenda forward in the future. Um, Ted? Yeah, Thanks, Ted, yeah, Ted, yeah. That's so sad. Why weren't we there? I've no context of that. Why didn't you invite me? No. <laughs> no, in, in all seriousness, I think it's yeah. a really good point to raise. And I'm sure we'll have a, a good discussion yeah. around that, but no strong opinions from me. Thanks very much, Gronny. Francesca. Yeah, I mean, I just want to point out that uh, um, one of the problems with knowledge sharing, everyone talks about best practices, what works, what's nice, uh, how easily we implemented this, and we had these great results. Uh, but people are generally very wary of saying, this didn't work, this yes. went badly, because X, Y, Z. And one of the things that uh, DOCD does is to compile comparable statistics. So that's a big part of, of the work we do. But the other is actually convene people at the table uh, in ways in which we're not judgmental. We allow people to discuss about uh, uh, different specific issues uh, and share knowledge on what works, which is what people generally want to focus on. But actually, outside the uh, general political kind of environment, uh, also share information of what they struggle with, uh, whether that's implementation, whether that's about having a shared vision, uh, whether that's about uh, national, local government, and etc. So I do think one of the things I always advocate about, and when people want to share with me, you know, best practices. Uh, Give me the ones that didn't work. That's the important information. And we already have such huge publication bias in the scientific literature telling us all these wonderful results that we never know what actually we shouldn't be trying again. Check, and then yeah. again, it doesn't work and we don't share information. And just, just wanted to back, go back one second to the point, uh, the very first question on responsible AI. One of the things we did looking at online vacancies for AI professionals was whether there was any reference to trustworthy AI, ethics in AI, uh, responsible AI, and it was less than 1%. If we think that actually the way in which you deliver and develop the algorithms has a bearing on what these systems are able to accomplish, then that's a serious problem. We have lawyers and doctors who need to comply with ethical principles. When we looked at the curricula of data scientists and et cetera, there was zero reference to ethics very little on philosophy and these will be incredibly important there are all the talks about having more arts uh, and in stem and moving into steam kind of uh, degrees but i would like to emphasize the importance of thinking ethically but in order to do that you may also want to throw in a little bit of training in the context of courses yeah thanks for that francesca barry we we leave you to. I'm going to in the in the 
I think a certain amount of justice for gender equality. I'm going to go to a question, a lady here in the audience, uh, but you, you uh, it's not the end. Let's put it that way. I've been allowed. I've not, Barry has said I can uh, go on for another five minutes. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, just very quickly, um, we do meet our colleagues in Europe. Um, the CIO group in Europe meet twice a year formally under the presidency system. Uh, but actually, personally, there's a group of like minded that we would meet quite regularly. For example, the Belgian CIO I, I met last week, um, Denmark, Finland, Estonia. We would have very close relationships with them. Belgium, I mentioned, Austria. Uh, so we do learn a lot uh, from each other. Um, in the technical space, actually, Ireland's quite different. Uh, it's a yeah. common law country. It doesn't have a people register. In some respects, it's an outlier because it sees itself as the center of the world, yeah. you know, because we very much have to look to our English speaking relatives yeah, of course. as much yeah. as our European relatives, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we do learn and we try and learn. Actually, what interests me more is how we learn off each other in the country. And I think we need to get into almost national uh, problem solving, you know, the the UK came up with this idea of the quadruple matrix, which mm. I liked so much that, yeah. I, that I've stolen. And that is that for a country to be successful, it needs to solve its problems with input from business, from government, from academia, and from society it's itself. Yeah. And I think that's the way we should go forward. We should have these conversations. Because another thing I often talk about is innovation does not come from the most clever person in the room. It comes from people having conversations about problems and how you can fix them. And everybody brings a different perspective to problem solving. And we need to hear that. Yeah. Thanks, Barry. And and you'd have the last word. My name is Anne Rebo already. Um, I am head of uh, digital skills in the Department of Further and Higher Education. So I am very interested in what you uh, all said, but in particular, Barry, you said that what we need is a pipeline of courses that look at the principle of delivering in IT systems. So how do we get academia to reconsider their courses, broaden them and, and deliver this? Do you have any ideas? Oh. First of all, like any of these things, the starting point is, do you accept you've got a problem? And I think mm -hmm. the stats and the dropout rate, and actually now seeing courses being canceled. So yeah. there's, an, there, there's a, an agreement that there's a problem or at least something we can do better. So that's a great way to open the conversation. I think then bringing into that conversation the employers and not just government, um, bringing in people who have been through the journey and have an opinion on it. And that actually includes people who have been through the journey and given up on it. Mm. Why? Um, and, and I think understanding what better looks like and, and uh, how we do it. There's a great friend of mine called Joe McDonough, mm. and he gave me the greatest line of transformation I've ever heard or read in any book. And he said, the secret to transformation is that we collectively... Uh, acknowledge and respect the past and issue an invitation to co-create the future. Mm. And I think that's a great lesson for us all because often when we bring people into a room to talk about things like this, they end up in bitching sessions yeah. and that doesn't help anybody. So if we honour the past and we talk about how we can bring our collective thinking to do something mm. better, we're going to get good end results because let me tell you, the ideas out there are phenomenal. The ideas in this room are phenomenal. We just mm. need to bring utilize together. them. Bronya. No comment. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Fr Francesca. You, you've no yeah. comment. Barry, there you have. You've stopped everybody <laughs> with yeah. your wisdom. But um, I think, unfortunately, our time is up, although we've, we've gone way over it. So I'd like to thank our panellists, um, Francesca, Anna, who unfortunately to leave us, Grania and Barry. I think you gave us a, an amazing uh, presentations that has got us thinking. I won't go through the main points because I'll be here for another five minutes, but you've got us thinking, you, you've broadened the idea of what skills are, how we can address it, the importance of mindset. But I'd hate to think that we'd 
go away kind of griping today because I think you've left us with a good thought. How do we go away, Barry, and co-create the future? And I think that's the challenges here because between all our presenters and panellists and indeed the minister's approach and mindset, I thought was, was very helpful in that he was talking about no complacency. We, we have to address the issue. We cannot leave anybody behind. So that co-creation, and I really issue a challenge both to our audience online and here to co-create that future because, you, you know, it is serious. If we don't address it in a way, you know, we will be left behind. We will not be leaders. We will not be asked to these EU events yet because we <laughs> we'll have nothing to contribute, and we know we don't like that. So we're we're sporting uh, and and a competitive, I think, uh, society. So I'd like to leave you with that thought. But I'd also like to thank you, the audience, for your participation and for your questions and, and for being with us today. Um, and I'd like to thank our colleagues here at the IIEA, Lorcan Mullally and, and Sarah Burke, who are on the production team. And to, I don't know whether we'll call you the creative team, but to uh, um, Seamus Allen, who's our policy, uh, digital policy researcher, Dr. Barry Colfer, um, who put this, um, all this event together. Thank you very much as well. And um, I hope you have a good afternoon and I hope you'll stay maybe for a cup of tea afterwards and co-create that future. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.